Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're actually seeing some sunshine today. Everybody hear me all right? Okay. Praise Yah. Hope all of you had a good week this week. Was busy and also maybe took time to uh, read and study your word. To look at this week's Torah portion. It's got a, <clears throat> like this Torah portion, like all of them, have tons of things that you could dwell on and, and drill down on and these types of things. <clears throat> but today, I decided to take just part of it, talk about the tale of two kingdoms, because it kind of starts here. And I uh, thought we'd just look at the biblical foundation, biblical history of what these two kingdoms, commonly known as two house theory. Oh no, not two house. But <clears throat> let's look at the, uh, the biblical foundation of it. Because <clears throat> a lot of different people really doesn't understand what the biblical meaning of two house is all about. Uh, I've heard it bat battered around quite a bit. Oh, well, those people are two house, don't have nothing to do with them. Well, that, and then you ask them, well, what is two house? Well, 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 I don't know, really. So I <clears throat> thought we'd just take a look at it, and uh, maybe we would uh, learn s something and also be able to answer those questions that you run into out there, uh, particularly in this movement that supposedly that we're in. I was even among <coughs> Hebrew roots, there's a misunderstanding of really what two house is. So we're going to begin in Genesis 27, uh, 47, 28, and you're gonna say, well, What's this got to do with two house? Well, here is the foundation of two house. This is where it begins. So, <clears throat> we're going to read in uh, Genesis 47, start at 28. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. So, here is something that <clears throat> I know all of us probably have come to this understanding that the name of Jacob is interchangeable with the name of Israel. Uh, the reason being is that when Jacob wrestled the angel, uh, he changed his name and said, you are now Israel. So, we know that <clears throat> the meaning of, of Israel is is one that has overcome, okay? Because that was what took place at that time. He has wrestled with the angel and won, basically. So he changed his name to Israel. So we pay attention to that name as it is used back and forth. Uh, Israel also is used to declare the, uh, the nation of Israel. But also in our story today, Israel becomes the name of one of the kingdoms. So we're going to look at that as we move on. <clears throat> says, and, it, uh, at the, and the time drew nigh that Israel must die, and he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. He's asking him to actually take an oath, to swear. Not just, uh, well, would you do this when I die? Will you take my bones? He said, no, I want you to swear. And us that have <clears throat> are following the Torah knows that swear, if you swear on something, then that's a very an elevated thing other than saying, well, I'll do it. It's higher than that. The position is higher than that. And that it 
with it become, uh, carries a lot of, of uh, responsibility and also possible punishment. Because, <clears throat> you know, the New Testament says, let your yeas be yea and your nays be nay, and not to go around swearing. So if you swear something and you don't do it, then you've actually sinned. So, <clears throat> but I'll live with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. Reasonable enough. He said, okay, Dad, I'll do it. But he said, swear unto me. And he swear unto him, and Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. Well, we know that there's a couple different meanings there. Could be his staff. <clears throat> but seemingly that he was getting up in age and maybe he was in, but still in bed. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick, and he took upon him his, with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph come unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, El Shaddai appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee and I will make of thee a multitude of people and will give this land to thy seed after thee for everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt before I came unto thee in, into Egypt are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. So we see here a, <clears throat> a quick adoption scene. He adopted them quite right away. He says, they are mine, even as. You know, <clears throat> because <clears throat> when we look at them, we have grandchildren. We say, yeah, we, we love our grandchildren, and, and they are our grandchildren. But he's saying, no. There's something above grandchildren. They're on the same plane as my sons. So he elevated them in their statute to be just like one of the 12 sons. So it's interesting. As we go on, we'll see some more information being parted. And as for me, when I came from Padam, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way. When yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrat, and I buried her there in the way of Ephrat, and the same is known as Bethlehem. And Israel beheld <clears throat> Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? Seems kind of strange, doesn't it? And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons whom Elohim hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eye of Israel were dim for age so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I have not thought to see my, thy face and lo Elohim hath even showed me also your seed. Interesting that he injects this idea that Israel is blind or is dim. His, his sight is not as like it should be introduces it here. So as we go on, and Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head. Ephraim said, who was the younger, and his left upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hand wittingly. For Manasseh was the firstborn, and he blessed Joseph and said, Elohim, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the, Elo the Elohim which fed me all of my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them, in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, let them grow into a multitude in the midst 
of the earth. So already we see that uh, these blessings are starting to flow and, and starting to be placed upon these two grandchildren, being as they're his only as his sons, <clears throat> and that they would grow and multiply in the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of <clears throat> Ephraim, it, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hands to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, No, not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Once again, here's the beginning of a blessing, a setting apart. You know, <clears throat> in our society, we don't really think about much the firstborn, that it's anything important. You know, we, it's not a thing that our society looks upon to set aside the, the firstborn as uh, <clears throat> inheriting uh, the wealth of the family and these types of things. Yet this is something that's from the very beginning. That the firstborn had a uh, higher uh, standing. And we see and we know all down through the ages how that the, the firstborn didn't ever seem like it worked out right. And always second to the second or to the youngest. So, <clears throat> and here we see a, a picture of Joseph, a dr artist rendition of this very act, of the two young lads being there and Joseph being there and saying, no, Father, because he thought that his father didn't see too well. And so he said, no, you're, you're, you're making a mistake. Here, here, let me help you. I know that you can't really see too well. <clears throat> but remember the word he used, wittingly? Knowingly, in other words. He knew what he was doing. It wasn't a mistake. So we go on, and he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, Elohim, make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he said, Ephraim, before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but Elohim shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brothers, which I took out of the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. You know the history here that he took the, the city of Shechem and he gave it to Joseph. <clears throat> Joseph, is a, this is in Genesis 49 as we move on. It says, Joseph is a fruitful bough. These are the blessings that he, that he came to name over each of his 12 sons as he felt like that uh, his life was not very long left upon this earth. He said, gather all of my sons. I want to give them a blessings and also to show them what will happen in the latter days. So these are more than just blessings. They are prophecies concerning the acts of these 12 sons plus the two sons, two grandsons. So this is the one about Joseph. He says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. The archers have solely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Even by the El of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heavenly, heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth underneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. So, <clears throat> this is not only a blessing, but like we said, a prophecy that we see that was, <clears throat> that was uh, fulfilled. Uh, it would come to fruition as we move into the New Testament, we see 
And First Peter says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to Yahweh by Yeshua the Messiah. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be, which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So we see that <clears throat> this uh, prophecy of, of Joseph being fulfilled in the, the birth and life of Yeshua, being that stone that, it was, that he t said it would be. It says, one of the blessings given to Ephraim was the leadership of Joshua. He was an Ephraimite, leading the children of Israel into the promised land. Through him, the tribe of Ephraim became the centralized power in the land of Canaan. Then following the blessing given to Judah that the kings would come through him, Saul, David, and Solomon, and eventually King Yeshua when he returns as king. So we're dealing with two different sons here, two different prophecies. Because we read in Genesis 49, 9, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his foal into the vine, and his ass's coat into the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. So once again, here we see a fulfillment of these prophecies. So the kingship will not depart from Judah until, or nor a lawgiver, from between his feet until Shiloh come. Shiloh being the Messiah. So, <clears throat> so we're going to trace down this story through the scriptures of basically these two sons. And we'll see what happens. In 1 Kings 11, 11, Wherefore <clears throat> Yahweh said unto Solomon, We all know that the kings of Israel was Saul and David and then his son Solomon. You know, <clears throat> the things that uh, you remember if you read this story where Solomon is the one that builds the temple. And how on the day of dedication, how <clears throat> that he prayed and that the uh, presence of Jehovah filled the temple so much that no one could enter. The smoke was so heavy. And he told him <clears throat> that your kingdom would be an everlasting kingdom as long as you walk in my pathways and do my statutes and commandments. But here we see, it says, Yahweh said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee. I will surely rend the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. So once again, here is a prophecy that's fulfilled almost immediately. Because he said, <clears throat> If as long as you walk in my pathway and do my statutes and commandments and lead this nation of people this way, you will last forever. But we know in reading the history of Solomon, and he winds up with about 900 wives and so on and so forth. He built them uh, groves to worship all of their gods in, for them to uh, offer sacrifice to some of their gods. So he says, because of what you have done, I will rend the kingdom from thee. He says, notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of, the hand of your son. 
Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David, my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. <clears throat> Once again, we know that King David was of the tribe of Judah, right? So was Solomon, his son. So <clears throat> here is his, his Solomon's son, is coming up here. I'm sorry. This is uh, Ephraim's son in 26. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite of Zered, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zerah, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. Interesting. Ephraimite, Joseph. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ajah, the Shilonite, found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment. And they too were alone in the field. And Ajah caught the new garment that was upon him and rent it, in twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take the ten pieces, for thus saith Jehovah, the Elohim of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give ten tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Interesting. One tribe. Yet we know as it Progress his own, it become two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. So, <clears throat> this is the very act of how it come about. Because if they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the Elohim of the Zedonites, Chemos, the Elohim of the Moabites, Melcom, the Elohim of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. Howbeit I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it unto thee even ten tribes. And unto his son will I give one tribe that David may my servant may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth, and shall be king over Israel. Speaking to Jeroboam, Israel, ten tribes. And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and will walk in my ways, and do that which is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto you. And I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt, unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Interesting. You know, even though Solomon knew that he had done wrong and that the kingdom was being rent from his hands and it would be given to his servant, yet he sought to kill him. <clears throat> Our flesh gets in the way quite a bit. It always has from the very beginning. And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all of Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his steed. So Rehoboam becomes the king of the two tribes, basically. And that's 
Pooh that uh, he was the kingdom rent out of his hands by Jeroboam. Rehoboam being from the tribe of Judah. <clears throat> and the other being from the tribe of Joseph. Ephraim. It says, Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith Yahweh Elohim of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all of his heart to do that which only was right in mine eyes. Seems like a, a broken record, doesn't it? From one generation to the other. One little simple thing that the father asked. And it wasn't very long after this took place that Jeroboam began to do these things. We know that Jeroboam built two golden calves in the northern kingdom. One at uh, <clears throat> You're not hearing very well. Sorry. He built two golden calves, uh, one in Bethel and one in Dan. And uh, those of you that have gone, gone there, they have a, what they call Tel Dan, where they're exploring the, the city of where this actual uh, golden calf was placed. And I think there's pictures that I think that y'all have of this. So he placed these there straight away, and he says, "You don't have to go up to Jerusalem to worship. You can stay right here." And I made two different places for you, Bethel and Dan. But that wasn't too good, was it? The father didn't like that at all. The father says, "That's not what I wanted you to do." You know, sometimes we we see that. We want to worship the Father the way that we want to do it and not the way that he has required us to do. We fi find it everywhere, basically. But that's not what it means to me. He knows my heart. I love him. But we're going to see a story of what happened to a king that actually turned to the Father but it didn't in the end turn out too good. It says, we're going to read in 9 here, it says, but hast, but hast done evil above all that were before you. For thou hast gone and made thee other Elohims and molten images to provoke me to anger and have cast me behind thy back. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male, him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung till it be all gone. Arise thou therefore, get thee to thine own house, and when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. You need to really read this whole story in 1 Kings 14. I just picked up the, the best part, but what happened was his son <clears throat> became very, very sick, sick unto death, and he sent his wife to go talk to the prophet and says, ask the prophet to uh, plead our case before the Jehovah and to save our son. Well, it wasn't too good when she got there. The prophet says, sorry, it's not going to be good. When you get home, the child is going to die. <clears throat> and all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found some good thing towards Jehovah, Elohim of Israel, in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, Yahweh shall raise him up a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what? Even now? For Yahweh shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of this good land, which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river. Once again, remember what he's talking about, Israel, the ten tribes of Israel. Israel. 
and shall scatter them beyond the river, because they have made their groves, provoking Yahweh to anger, and he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin and who made Israel to sin. It says, eventually, after repeating repeated prophetic warnings about the prevalence of Baal worship, the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes, Ephraimites, were conquered by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. and were scattered among the nations and never returned to the land of Israel as a kingdom. So we read in Matthew 15, 24, but he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then we read in Matthew 10, 5, these 12 Yahshua sent forth and command them saying, go not into the way of the nations into any city of the Samaritans enter you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, we see <clears throat> that Yeshua's time, that he was trying to regather his people, particularly starting with the ten tribes that had been scattered throughout the world. And we see in some of the writings as we go on, so we've talked about the northern, it's called the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, called northern tribes, Israel, ten tribes. So we've talked about the northern tribe. Now we're going to start talking about the southern kingdom. This is in 2 Kings 22. Joash was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Judiah. Jediah, the daughter of Adahiah of Boscath. And he did that which was right in the sight of Yahweh, and walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to Yahweh with all of his heart, and with all of his soul, and with all of his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. This story you have to really read because at first he wasn't, he was an evil king. But <clears throat> he sent some of the people to do a refurbishing of, of Jerusalem and so forth and in their digging and finding they found the book. So when he brought the book back to the king he says, he said, man, we have really sinned. We have not been keeping what God's law says. The king took the book and read it, and he took and he destroyed all the hope, high places and so on and so forth and the ostrils and all those types of things, uh, beg forgiveness of God and all these things. So it says, neither after him arose any like him. Let's see what happens. As we go on, it says, Notwithstanding, Yahweh turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger, anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. You might say, well, that's not fair. That's not a loving God. I had a whole king that tried to turn the whole kingdom to follow Jehovah. He says, even though what you've done is right, <clears throat> my fierce anger <clears throat> will still fall upon Judah. So seemingly there is a point that where that we may forgive, get forgiveness, but we still have to suffer the consequences of our actions. even though that we have turned from those things. It's just an interesting concept. It's, always, it's almost like, wow. Really? And Yahweh said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel. 
and will cast off this city Jerusalem which I have chosen and the house of which I said my name shall be there. So we see the same things fixed to happen to the southern kingdom of Judah as happened to the northern kingdom being run over by another nation and taken captive and carried away. <clears throat> so Joachim slept with his fathers and Joachim his son reigned in his steed. And the king of Egypt came not again any more out of his land for the king of Babylon had taken from the river of Egypt unto the river of Euphrates all that pertained to the king of Egypt. Joachim was 18 years old when he began to reign. and He reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elinath of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh according to all that his father had done. And at that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city and his servants did besiege it. It said, And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came, he and all of his hosts against Jerusalem, and pitched against it, and they built forts against it round about. And the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine prevailed in the city, and there was no bread for the people of the land. That's where they actually ate each other, if you read in the story. <clears throat> and the city was broken up and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between two walls which is by the king's garden now the Chaldees were against the city round about and the king went the way towards the plain and the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho and all of his army were scattered from him So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon to Rebab, and they gave judgment upon him. And they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with fetters of brass and carried him to Babylon. And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar Nebzar Dan, captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon unto Jerusalem. And he burnt the house of Yahweh and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt he with fire. And all the army of the Chaldees that were with the captain of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. So the southern kingdom, two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, went into captivity in Babylon in 586 B.C. But they returned years later in 457 B.C. under the kings of Persia, Cyrus and Darius, and Artaxerxes after Persia defeated Babylon according to Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezra. And Ezra and Nehemiah directed the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem where later Yeshua would walk and later was destroyed once again in 70 A.D. by the Romans. So in reality, all the tribes of Israel are somewhat scattered throughout the world. There was some that came back to Jerusalem. Some actually stayed in Babylon. So in a sense, there's some of those that are still scattered. Okay, let me see if I can find it now. Don't ever drop your notes. It makes a mess. <laughs> First Peter 1.1 1, 1. Peter, an apostle of Yeshua the Messiah, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Merthenia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of Yahweh the Father 
through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Yeshua the Messiah, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the Elohim and Father of our Master, Yahshua the Messiah, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah from the dead. Begotten us again. We were always part of Israel, right? Just been scattered says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of Yahshua or Yahweh through faith and to salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Are we not being revealed in the last time? Is it not Israel being revealed? This is in Ezekiel 20, 33. It says, As I live, saith the sovereign Yahweh, surely with a mighty hand, with stretched out hand, arm, and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people, and will gather you out of the countries wherein that you are scattered. With a mighty hand, with stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the sovereign Yahweh. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. That's exactly where we are. That's exactly where the Father has been to get to, to recover all of his children, all of Israel bring us back into the bond of the covenant. <coughs> and I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourned and I will not enter and they shall not enter into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am Yahweh. As for you, O house of Israel, Thus saith the sovereign Yahweh, Go ye, serve ye every one his idols. And hereafter also, if ye will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. For in mine holy mountain, in the mountain of the heights of Israel, saith the sovereign Yahweh, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me, there will I accept them. So we seeing language of reconciliation bringing back together it says the hand of Yahweh was upon me this is in Ezekiel 37 and carried me out in the spirit of Yahweh and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and he caused me to pass by them round about and behold there was very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O sovereign Yahweh, you know. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. Thus saith the sovereign Yahweh unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Hear the word of Yahweh. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am Yahweh. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold a shaking, and the bones came together bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them about, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy to the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the sovereign Yahweh, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain. That 
that they may live. I believe it's supposed to be it. Ezekiel 37, 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came, up, uh, <clears throat> came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the sovereign Yahweh, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, cause you to come up out of your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel. This is interesting because we're going to read something here in a minute. And you shall know that I am Yahweh when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, Yahweh, have spoken it and performed it, says Yahweh. Ah, that's what I thought. I don't know if you've ever <clears throat> read that account there and, and had thoughts about really what, what was he talking about and when would this might happen. This is in Daniel 12, 1. <coughs> and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was, since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn a many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Could this be what Ezekiel could be alluding to? Because we're going to read in Thessalonians. It's a whole different wording. This is different from the resurrection that is in 1 Thessalonians. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yeshua will Elohim bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of Yahweh, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Master shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Master himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of Yahweh, and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. Then wit, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Master in the air, and so shall we ever be with Yahweh. Are these two different resurrections? Give you something to contemplate about. It's interesting. I think you, you Daniel res, resurrection is a special resurrection. That's what I believe, and it's only for the house of Israel. <clears throat> Take a look at it. Study it. Uh, we're going to go to Ezekiel thirty-seven fifteen. It says the word of Yahweh came again unto me, saying. Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, and take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in, his, in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou mean by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the sovereign Yahweh, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, 
and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. Okay. So we'd have to ask the question, has this happened? As we go on, it says, And the sticks wherein thou writest shall be in thine hand before thine eyes, and say unto them, Thus saith the sovereign Yahweh, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and there shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein that they have sinned, and will cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their Elohim. The gathering back of the whole, both kingdoms back together. We're not talking about the ten tribes or some Gentile church that doesn't even fit in the picture. It's only Israel as a whole coming back together. You know, it's, it's interesting as most of the people that are, that are Jews and so forth, they don't see this split. They think that it's it's all, they're all now, that's the reason that they're being called Jews. And, it, and it's interesting because I don't know if you ever thought, those people that are in Israel today, the majority of them, probably 95% of them, don't know what tribe that they came from. We have, have thought, well, that that's Judah. Could be. I'm sure that they're part, Judah is part in there. But are they all just Judah and Benjamin that's there? And I heard this from an actual Jew himself. He says, most people in Israel don't know what tribe that they came from. <clears throat> Other than possibly Levi. They say that there is a DNA, DNA marker for the Levites. Interesting. <clears throat> and David my servant shall be king over them and they shall all have one shepherd and they shall also walk in my judgments observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. So we read in Romans 9, 1 to 8, I say the truth in Messiah, lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself was accursed from the Messiah for my brethren, my kindred, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the honor, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of Elohim, and the promises Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, the Messiah came, who is over all, Yahweh, be blessed forever. Not as though the word of Elohim hath not hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of Elohim, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So, Interesting here, it says, Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption? That word put right in there, adoption. Not only adoption of all people in, but the readoption of themselves. 
back in. <clears throat> says, Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the nations. As he said also in Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. It shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living Elohim. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For I speak to you nations, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Who is the root? And who is the branch? Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bear not the root, but the root thee. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bear not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou stand by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if Elohim spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of Yahweh of them which fell, severity but towards these goodness of if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for Elohim is able to graft them in again. So it seems like it always, it, the whole history of, the, of these two kingdoms it all come down to obedience, right? It says, you are my people, and I'll be your God as long as. Just because it's you say you're Israel doesn't really cut it. <coughs> as the conversation that he had with some of me, said, they said, well, we, we be the children of Abraham. What did he tell them? says, if you be the children of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. <coughs> Romans 11. It says, for if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall thee, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? They're not being grafted in to the church, the Jews, the Israel. There's not one kingdom here and another kingdom here. The Gentile church, Israel. No. It says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the nations be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away wickedness from Jacob. For this is my covenant to them when I shall take away their sins. It says, For ye are all the children of Yahweh by faith in the Messiah Yeshua. For as many of you who have been baptized into the Messiah have put on the Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor free male. For you are all one in the Messiah, Yeshua. And if you be the Messiah, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The several promises that he made to Abraham. One was the land. Right? And there was a famine in the land. Genesis 26, 1. <clears throat> there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went out into Amalek, king of the Philistines, and to Gur. And Yahweh appeared to him and said, Go not down into Egypt, and dwell in the land which I shall tell of thee. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee, and unto thy seed, I will give all of these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear to Abraham your father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. 
And I will give unto thy seed all of these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And this is a story of the two houses. This is uh, the biblical, what happened, how it came about, what is the father trying to bring back together these two houses. He said, I don't want to divide my, my people any longer. I want them all together, all seeing eye to eye. That's what he says. When all see eye to eye, he will bring again Zion. So, <clears throat> if we learn anything at all, we know that uh, the reason why that this thing took place, and it was not in God's plan, I can tell you that. He didn't plan on splitting up his people. So, <clears throat> we're living in a time where God is trying to, to bring all of his people back together. The two house. The the ten, ten tribes, the two tribes, whatever you want to call them. So it's not, it's not a something to be divisive about. It's to say hallelujah that Jehovah is still wanting all of his people together. The ten tribes and the two tribes. So there's uh, a work to be done from bo on both sides, the work that uh, we have to do to bring about those lost people, lost ten tribes of Israel that are in the world today, that the Holy Spirit is calling. It's what this whole movement is about, is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is not by my might or by my power, but by your Holy Spirit will these things be accomplished and done. So, I hope you have a better understanding how to present this to people that you come in contact with to show that, it's, that we're not teaching a different message. We're not teaching a different uh, God. We're not teaching that, uh, that we're the Gentile church or that we are the church. Uh, has nothing to do with it. It has bringing all of his people back together once again. So, Shabbat Shalom to everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for watching a teaching from Amet HaTorah. If you are ever in the Odessa area, we would love to welcome you to our Shabbat service, 11 a.m. every Sabbath. For more information or for more teachings, feel free to find us on the web www.amethatoraodessa.com Also, you can find us on Facebook. Thank you. God bless you and your family. Shalom.